Hey, I don't know if you have ever done something dumb. Why do preachers always start with a story about how dumb they are? But uh, I've got a doozy for you today. Uh, I work at the offices at Curate and we're very close to the uh, hockey field and I have to stare at this fence all the time. The hockey fence, around the hockey field. Now, when I was younger, um, not so long ago, uh, I made a big mistake with that hockey fence. I was approaching the fence with two of my mates and a couple of girls, and we came to the door, the gate that opens up, and I thought, you know what, this may be 10 foot, 12 foot high, I reckon I could jump that. So, yeah, here we go. So I ran to the fence, I jumped up, and as I went over the top, there was a wire sticking up, which caught my kneecap, opened up my kneecap, about a six inch cut, and ripped through my shorts, right through the middle. Thank you God it didn't collect something else on the way through. But ripped through my shorts, ripped them clean in two. And as I came down on top of the fence, I got impaled on the wire. Yep, it was as bad as it sounds. So I'm sitting there, my friends have gone through the gate and I am impaled on this fence. They turn and look at me and say, are you coming in, bro? I'm like, yeah, I can, I can actually see pretty good from up here, which is ridiculous because I was facing this way and the game was this way. And I was trying to look like, yeah, uh, I, I can see good from here. And it, it's, it's ridiculous. I'm sitting on this fence. I've got a, a six-inch gash, gash in my right knee. Blood is pouring down my leg and filling my shoe. I am now wearing a mini skirt because they're no longer shorts. They've been ripped clean in two. I had to lift myself off the nail, the wire, a, a number eight wire too, by the way, nice and thick. Lift myself off, crawl down the fence, and then ride my bike home, splashing myself all the way. Looked like something out of a horror movie. Why do I bring that story up? It's quite a painful memory. God has brought that story to my mind many times, many times, uh, which I think is rather cruel. But I said to him, why are you showing me this story? Why this story? And he said, there are many of my people who are doing the thing that they thought was right, but it's landed them stuck on the fence because they are failing to use the gate that I provided. Is that you today? Are you a little bit stuck on the fence? Hopefully not as gory as I was, but sometimes life happens. Things happen. And I'm really excited today to talk about a way that we can actually disengage from being stuck on the fence and go through the door that Jesus has provided for us. By the way, he did say, I am the door. Oh man, I love following Jesus, but it is very challenging. I, I believe today God would say to us, take a new door. It's actually not a new door, it's an old door. And he wants to do something new in your life with something old. Take a new path with an old way. I love, <clears throat> I love where we're at as a church, leaning into chapter 2. What is this chapter 2 thing all about. Before I even get into my message, I want to give us a bit of context around what chapter 2 is and could be for you. Chapter 2, I, I love to refer to it as moving from a hurried and shallow faith to deep transformation of the soul. We are in grave danger. We are doing more for Jesus than our inner life can sustain. Too much to do, too little time, we say yes without thinking. We procrastinate with meaningless activities. And then we complain that we're too busy. We're stressed and anxious. Some of us may even feel close to burnout. And many of us feel guilty about our lack of spiritual practices, like reading the Bible, praying, silence and solitude, fasting and Sabbath. We allow our doing for God to far outweigh our being with God. Just let that sink in for a second. Doing Christian behaviours is not enough. No more, you're no more a Christian because you come to church than you are a McDonald's hamburger because you go to McDonald's. 
coming to church, going to a small group, reading spiritual development books, not stealing or lying or cheating. Being a Christian is not actually enough. Doing good things is not enough. The New Testament calls us three, uh, Christians only three times, but it calls us disciples over 268 times. We need to be disciples of Jesus. And in order to be a disciple of Jesus, we are going to need to follow the way of Jesus. That's why I love this series, Practicing the Way of Jesus. When Joel asked me to uh, bring a talk to you guys today, I was like, flip, I love the idea of this series. I love it. There are things that I have put into practice in my life that are changing who I am changing the way I approach God. It's not rocket science though, is it? Being focused on more of being with Jesus and less on doing for Jesus is going to require some change. Oh, what I love is Luke 2 verse 52 says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It's interesting, isn't it? How even Jesus, who was God, grew spiritually. Man, Jesus grew spiritually. He grew in favor with God and he grew in favor with men. And it's the same for us as his disciples. We must grow spiritually. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul tells us we are all being transformed into God's image with ever increasing glory. As disciples of Jesus, we must allow him to transform us into his likeness but it's hard to be a disciple of Jesus with so much noise in this world around us to get vaccinated to not get vaccinated what is happening with the markets what's not happening with the markets wanting to buy a home like there's just so many struggles and human tendencies guys the struggle is real the world is pulling us in a particular direction and God is drawing us gently in another direction. D.A. Carlson puts it like this. We do not drift towards holiness. We do not naturally gravitate toward godliness. Prayer, obedience of scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. Instead, we drift toward compromise. And we call it tolerance. We drift toward disobedience and call it freedom. Guys, we need to slow down. Jesus was not in a hurry. If we're going to be more like him, we're going to need to do some things a little different. In his book, The Emotionally Healthy Leader, Peter Scazzaro warns us that we must slow down if we experience one or some of the following. I'm going to read some questions out. If you see yourself in some of these, uh, you might be one of these people. Uh, We need to slow down if we experience the following. We can't shake the pressure of having too much to do and too little time. We're always rushing. We're often fearful about the future. We are overly concerned with what others think. We are defensive and easily offended. We are distracted. We ignore the stress, anxiety, and tightness of our bodies. We feel unenthusiastic or threatened by the success of others. We often spend more time talking than listening. Man, I think I hear myself in most of those. I got some work to do. Uh, Don't put that in the chat. I got some work to do. Uh, just, Just tuck it inside for a while. It's time for us all to find a new rhythm. Me included. To stop thinking we can get away from trying to jump the fence and getting stuck on the fence instead of walking through the door that God's actually provided for us. That door's actually been there the whole time. I'm not talking about some fantasy door from Narnia either. I'm talking about the Jesus door, the ancient path, the ancient way, returning to the ways that the scriptures call us to live. Jeremiah 6.16 says, This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. 
Man, that sounds good. That sounds so good. What is one of the ancient ways? Today, I am going to talk to you about a topic I love and I've put into practice for at least the last year, something I'm very passionate about. In fact, as I was preparing this message, I kept seeing a picture of myself holding a golden key. And I was so excited, like it was Christmas, like, oh my goodness, I get to give this key to my friends. I get to give this key to my community, the people I love, the people I care about, the people I serve. And it's my privilege today to talk to you about practicing Sabbath. Somebody a shout out in the chat, bring back Sabbath. Now when I say Sabbath, I don't mean the band that Ozzy Osbourne fronted. Uh, Sabbath. It comes from the we, uh, Hebrew word Shabbat. Shabbat, which literally means to stop, to cease. As Tim the Toolman and Taylor would say, tools down, tools down. Shabbat can be also translated as delight. Stop and delight. Stop hurrying from this thing to that. Just chill out. Breathe. Enjoy the moment. Delight in the Lord. Sounds good, doesn't it? So what is Sabbath? I know the concept of Sabbath can seem a bit foreign and a little bit unclear, so I'll spell it out a little bit as much as I can, uh, but I haven't written a book on it. I've done a bit of research and I've lived it quite a bit. Uh, Sabbath is a 24-hour block of time where we stop work to enjoy rest and to delight in the Lord. No more work, paid or unpaid, but rest. No more emails, but rest. No more shopping or errands, but rest. No more jobs around the house, hallelujah, but rest. The ancient Israelites, they, they didn't know what that rest actually was like. You know, they were slaves working seven days a week for 400 years. Their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, their great-great-great-grandparents, 400 years worth of slavery. And when God freed them from their Egyptian oppressors, he had to give them, uh, give them some help to reset these things, uh, reset some ways of, of thinking to some ways which aligned more to where he wanted them to go. So he gave them some things called the Ten Commandments. Have you heard about the Ten Commandments before? They're pretty good, they're still relevant, so it's all good. One of these Ten Commandments was actually significantly longer than the others. It's like God knew that we needed a little bit of extra help with this one. And before I read this, if you think the Ten Commandments are Old Testament, they're old school, they're old news, uh, I guess you're probably fine with stealing, murder, coveting your neighbor's barbecue. No. No, they're all still relevant. Jesus did nothing to abolish the Ten Commandments when he came. All he did was call us to a higher standard. So let's go to commandment number four. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. This is good. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign residing in your towns, any foreigner. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Man, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath day holy? You might be like me and say, I don't have time for Sabbath. I am too busy. I am too important. I've got too much going on. Uh, like, honestly, if I could just be really upfront for a moment, like, I've been in full time ministry for 18 years, 
And I've got to be straight up with you, I've only been practicing Sabbath for the last year. If you're going to put something in the chat, put what the heck was he doing those first 17 years? I thought, I didn't have time. I can't afford to do it. I'm too busy. I've got too many emails. I've got too many volunteers, too many teams, too many things to do. Not enough time to do it. I've got my to-do list for work and the to-do list at home. Don't you act like you didn't give me that list, Ellie. You know you wrote that list for me. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. I was running around like a headless chicken. And then one day my wife, who is way smarter than me and clearly more beautiful than me, came to me and said, I think we should start practicing Sabbath. And I was like, mate, no way. I haven't got the time. I can't do this. So I kicked and screamed like the pastor that I am. Just, you know, just ignored it, ignored the facts, ignored my body, ignored the stress, and ignored the anxiety, and just uh, pushed on, pushed on. You know what? Eventually gave in, praise the Lord. And I said to her, I'll give you half a day. I can't do a whole day. It's just too hard. So I'll give you half a day. We'll start with half a day. We'll start on Friday morning and I'll go to Friday lunchtime. Yay me, so spiritual. Uh, it's a big adjustment. It's a big adjustment going from running around for seven days a week to stopping for a whole day of rest. And that might be you today. You might be listening going, what the heck? I can't give up a day. I'm too busy. I've got too much on. We all actually have the same amount of time. We all have the freedom to choose. How much time do you actually spend on Insta or Twitface? Or scrolling through Trade Me? Or playing Candy Crush on your phone? Or binge watching Netflix? I've got, I got the bubble game that I play on my phone. It's dangerous. But yeah, I, I do my best. According to Google, the average person spends around two and a half hours a day on social media and around three hours a day watching Netflix or TV. I'm not saying that's you, it's probably your friend. But before you say you don't have time for Sabbath, consider what you currently do have time for. Guys, if you want to become more like Jesus and grow spiritually and lean into him, you're going to have to find some time to make time for Sabbath. What day should I do Sabbath on? That's a good question. For us, for Ellie and I, it's 6 p.m. Thursday till 6 p.m. Friday. It just works with our weekly rhythms. The Apostle Paul says, one day for Sabbath is as good as another in Romans 14. The day actually doesn't matter. What matters is setting aside 24 hours to rest, connect with the Lord, and fill your soul. So I want to give you a couple of points today, a couple of things you can put into practice. I want to make this as practical as I possibly can to help you and to help me reinforce. Practice Sabbath as rest. What is and what isn't considered when you're practicing Sabbath as rest? Stop your work, all paid and unpaid work, and enjoy rest. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. <laughs> yeah, he makes me lie down. I've had seasons in my life where he's made me lie down. Seasons where I was anonymous. Seasons of rest. Seasons of restoring, seasons of rebuilding, seasons of reset. But once we stop, we enter into God's invitation to rest. Genesis 2, verses 1 to 4. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array, but the seventh day God had finished the work and he that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. God rested. Man, if I was God, I would just zap myself and be like, Psst, 
like back to 100%. You know those video games when you can eat a special thing and your health goes back up? Like, I'd be like that. I'd, I've got things to do. But God rested. And God is inviting us to follow him, to follow what he does. It's no coincidence, too, that man was made on the sixth day. And our first full day with God was a day of rest. Start the week from a place of rest. Relax. Jump on the spa pool. Chill out. Go for a walk. Hang out with friends. Read a book. Practice delight. When I say delight, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I mean, enjoy it. I'm giving you permission today to enjoy life. To celebrate. To celebrate creation to go to a cafe, to have a surf, to fill your soul with the goodness of God and his creation. This is good stuff, isn't it? Dan Ellender in his book, Sabbath, had this to say. The Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath, when experienced as God intended, is the best day of your lives. Without question or thought, it is the best day of the week. It is the day we anticipate on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and the day we remember on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Sabbath is the holy time where we feast, play, dance, have sex, sing, hello, sing. It's great to have the men who've just joined us back in the conversation. Uh, we've lost you there. We've been talking about Sabbath for the last 20 minutes. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I'm back to it. Sing, pray, laugh. Tell stories, read, paint, walk, and watch creation in its fullness. Few people are willing to enter the Sabbath and sanctify it, to make it holy, because a full day of delight and joy is more than most people can bear in a lifetime, let alone a week. Man, how good does that sound? How good does that sound? to be full of joy and delight and lightness and life. So for us, what we do is we start Sabbath, six o'clock on a Thursday. The very first thing we do is we light a candle. We light a candle to signify the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're identifying that he's there, he's with us, and that this is his time now. And we're entering into Sabbath, we're entering into a time of rest. We usually have a meal with friends, we connect, we drink a nice bottle of wine, we gather, we talk about God, we try and keep the conversation on God, we try and steer away from things which pull us away from God, steer things towards God, steer things towards holiness. The next morning we walk up the mount, around the mount, usually I go around the mount, Ellie goes up the mount, obvious reasons, bad knees. Uh, we have a list. We have a list that we've written in our, uh, in our laundry. It's written on the wall. Our to-do list and our to-don't list. We contemplate God. 1 John 3 verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. This is good. God is good and he is worth focusing on. Take a day to focus on him. To rest in his presence. And focus on the goodness of who he is. Another thing we want to do with Sabbath is we want to practice Sabbath as resistance. Sabbath is actually countercultural to the world. The world says run, it says hustle, Jesus says rest. It says my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're supposed to be the most rested, relaxed people on the planet. Sometimes I feel anything but that. But that's the, that's the point, is that we're on a journey pursuing Jesus. I don't know if you are old enough, <clears throat> like I am, to remember when the weaking laws changed uh, for trading. Uh, it wasn't actually until 1980, sometime 1980, that Saturday trading, uh, trading actually became allowed for the whole day. It was only available to like, like lunchtime. Um, and it was 1990 before a law was passed that you could actually trade on Sunday. Sabbath used to be really clear cut because the shops were closed. But now, in the last 30 years, 
we've settled into the culture of around us of just working seven days. And it's not right. Romans 12 verse 2 in the message says, Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. This world wants us to hustle. It wants us to run. It screams at us to keep up appearances, to show your capacity, how much you can handle. And we do this day to day, all the time. And we think we're just too important. I love this quote from Wayne Muller. Muller, Muller, Wayne Muller. Sabbath is not dependent upon our readiness to stop. We do not stop when we are finished. We do not stop when we complete our phone calls, finish our project, get through this stack of messages or get, to this, get out this report that's due tomorrow. We stop because it's time to stop. Sabbath requires surrender. If we only stop when we have finished all our work, we will never stop because our work is never completely done. Sabbath dissolves this artificial urgency of our days because it liberates us from the need to be finished. The galaxy will somehow manage without us for this day, and so we are invited to relax and enjoy our relative unimportance, our humble place at the table in a very large world. Slow down. It can wait. Jesus was never in a hurry. If you're going to be his disciple, you're going to need to slow down. Sabbath is God's gift. It's God's door. Don't get stuck on the fence. Right, my time's nearly done. I want to make this as practical as I possibly can for you. What do you want me to do with this? Ask God, what does he want you to do? Are you too hurried? Are you too busy? Do you need a course correct? Just ask him. Where can I start with practicing Sabbath? Why don't you start, if you're you're super busy and super important like me, like I thought I was, and it's it's a big adjustment, trust me, and it's a constant adjustment. Start with half a day. Go easy on yourself and then, and build it up to a day. But if you're brave, go cold turkey. One day, set it aside, plan for it, get excited about it. It's going to be a great, great time. Leaning into God, pursuing his presence and his goodness. I love to get out my guitar and just worship while none of you are around. It's my best worship. It's my best offering because it's not for anybody else other than God. Write a to-do list and a to-don't list. Have a to-do list and a to-don't list. What am I going to do? What am I not going to do? Brainstorm a list of things that fill your soul. Brainstorm a list of things that you will not do. For me, going for a surf, going for a walk, going to a cafe, having a, an afternoon granddad nap. I'm not a granddad yet, but I, I do feel like I am sometimes with all my afternoon naps. Relax. But also, it's really important to say what you won't do. I don't read the paper on my Sabbath day. I get sucked into the world. It doesn't fill my soul. It sucks the life out of me. Don't go to the movies. Don't fill yourself with entertainment. Pursue God. Pursue the goodness of God. It's so crazy how we fit into the world and we go to the movies and we're entertained straight up by sin. Murder, stealing, killing. And then we say, I do this to refresh my soul. Really? Y'all need to take a good look. Only God can refresh your soul in the way that you need it. Set some time aside for him. It's just one day, but it's going to be your greatest day. Hey, I know there's people watching this right now, and you think, hey, Tony, I'm actually not even really a follower of Jesus just yet. Firstly, I just want to say thank you for leaning in. Thank you for watching Cure It Online. I know some of you who are watching this right now are not yet believers in Jesus. But there's a pull inside you. This day will work for you. 
If you put Sabbath into practice and you take a day to set it aside as a holy day, to contemplate God and to pursue him, he promises, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Test me. I'd love, yeah, I'd love you to try it. Just give it a try. Give it a whirl. A couple of months, see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? You could be relaxed. And the best thing you could happen is you could connect with the creator of your soul. It would change everything.